So it's going to be a thing about Docker. Um, basics with a little bit more details in there. Uh, I'm not an expert by any definition of an expert, but I do use Docker um, <laughs> for lots of interesting fun things. So top level, high level kind of stuff, and then I've got a fairly huge amount of uh, demos. Uh, we're going to do them live. So let's hope my machine doesn't fail. OK, Docker. Hi, I'm Ellie. Um, we're going to talk about Docker and maybe some DevOps type stuff at the end. I intentionally left some of that out on this for right now because I figured I was already going way over an hour and a half. So if we have time, we can continue to talk about it. That's my Twitter handle and my Google Plus thing. I decided not to put my curriculum video on here. I work for UF. I'm one of the IT architects at UF. I work in EIS, um, the architect, whatever. OK, so like all good things, let's go over the agenda. We're going to talk about what are Linux containers, um, how they're different from VMs, and then we're going to actually go into what is Docker, how its networking works, how its disk works, some demos, and then if we have time, we're going to talk about orchestration, but we're probably not going to have time. And I also left it out. Um, so what are Linux containers? So I found the pretty good summation on Wikipedia. It's basically C groups and a bunch of different namespaces. So you can basically contain a process or a set of processes in their own little namespace bubble. And I'll actually show you what that feels and looks like to the process. Um, but that's basically what it's been. It is. It's been around for a while. Um, 2624 is when it was officially in there using LXE, which is the Linux container framework. Um, other things that kind of look and feel like it are like Chirrut and FreeBSD jails, Solaris containers, and God help me, if anybody in here other than me has actually worked with the IX workload partitions, I'm sorry. Um, and if you've ever played with OpenVZ, OpenVZ does something very similar, but they do it very, very differently and whatever. Has anybody had any familiarity with any of these things? Chiroots or jails or, OK, yeah. For the one person. Although it's basically you're representing the entire Linux POSIX user space environment in a totally different area. So your slash is no longer the system slash. It's different. It's its own little thing. You make changes there. It's its own thing. Your process ID space is different. So when you type a PS, you'll you may or may not actually see an init, and you'll actually see what I'm talking about here when we show you when I show you a demo. Um, but you, you're probably not going to see all the system processes. You'll only see what you see. You have a different, entirely different UID and GID mapping that is just for you. So UID 0 now maps onto, or UID 1 now maps onto something entirely different just for you. So, um, so how's, it, how's this actually done in Linux? Basically, using a combination of C groups and all of the various namespace components that has been in Linux kernel for a long time. So C groups, does anybody in here actually play with C groups or intentionally use C groups? Because you know you're using it unintentionally by default. So C groups are uh, basically, it's a way to limit processes to specific system resources. So think nice, as in the nice command, but way, 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 way more extensive. So you can literally limit a process to, you can't eat up any more, more than X amount of memory, hard limit. And it's much more harder than a U limit. Um, you can basically say, this process is only allowed this many number of IOPS in total. You can tell it that it can only be scheduled on this NUMA node or down to the specific CPU, a whole bunch of other fun things. Um, Container groups. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I, or no, compute groups. Sorry, it's not container. Um, I believe that's right. Uh, namespaces have been in the kernel for a long time. Uh, again, around the two six time space. Um, has anybody done anything interesting with namespaces before? I very much doubt it because nobody's ever. It's it's so weird. I've never touched it. Um, you're using them. You're using the default namespace when you're booting up your box. 
there are many other namespaces. You can create dynamically create namespaces and shove your processes in into them. And basically, you can, I mean, as I wrote here, you can map any of the default things to a different, to, for a process differently. So in containers, they basically remap the root user, UID one or whatever it might be, if you're, well, if he's got Kali, so it's actually a little bit different there. Um, you can map it to a different UID in the main process tree. And basically, the, it's a branching hierarchy. So you've got your main root normal namespace, and then you can say, OK, I'm going to create a sub namespace, and UIDs 0 to 100 in this namespace map to UIDs 10,000 to 10,100 in the root namespace. So you can basically you know, have non-overlapping. You can separate them. You can do the same thing with process trees. You can either expose the, the root process tree information to child namespaces or not. Docker does not, and you'll see that. You can limit network access by putting it in a net, different network space, uh, namespace. So ETH0 is no longer ETH0. It's something else, and it's mapped to a different namespace, and you got to plug the two together in some way or another to make it work. You can even have it mount, have it have an have it pretend that, let's say, uh, var temp image dot uh, ext4, you can say that that disk can be mounted as if it is slash in a different namespace. So if you live in that namespace, your slash is actually a loopback file mounted from the root namespace. That gets used extensively here as well. So that's, that's the kind of idea with namespaces. Again, I don't think everybody uses them. No, almost nobody uses them manually. It's mostly done for containers. So question that comes up everywhere is how are containers different from VMs? And this is, uh, I'll give you my two cents, but uh, this is kind of like religion. Everybody's got one. <laughs> First facts. Um, VMs try to emulate or abstract the system away at the hardware level. So it's like, oh, here's a CPU. Here's a PCI memory space. Your memory mapped is different. It, you're, what you'd expect out of the regular x86-64 system, eh, it looks that way to you. But to the host system, it's not. You might be all over the place in the real, page, in the real physical memory space. You might have a different TLB, all kinds of fun stuff. But all in all, to your process and to your system, it looks like hardware. Now, you, there are tricks to figure out if you're on or not virtualized hardware, and they're getting better at actually saying, I'm on virtualized hardware. But that's basically what it is. Um, the whole concept behind the VM was we're going to abstract the hardware so that any software can run on here. That was the, That's kind of where it all came from. Now, here's the religion part. Um, some people actually are. Now that containers are getting popular and everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, a lot of people are saying, well, containers or VMs are not really heavyweight and you know, you don't need those things anymore. You can do everything that you did there. Well, my argument is not it's not that straight and clear. You need to think about what you're doing and evaluate what, what's going on. If you're talking about commercial software, it's probably not going to be packaged in a container, most likely. A lot of open source software is, and that's cool. It works great. That's actually why one of the reasons that I actually use containers. Um, but if it's commercial software or you actually need a system and you're going to run multiple things on it, that's VMs make sense. Um, a container, fundamentally, it's a runtime. It is not a hardware abstraction. When you're actually running container, you're using the host system's kernel. So. Let's say, in our case today, we're going to be SSHing into a box that's Red Hat 7. The uh, containers that I've got on there, some of them are Ubuntu, some of them are CentOS, some of them are Debian. But ultimately, they don't care. They're not running a kernel. They're getting a runtime environment that they can run in that looks POSIX-like. So there's a slot, there's a file systems, there's a POSIX semantics. They can do locking. They can get access to memory with the regular type of things that you do. Um, so they, they feel like they're just another process on a Unix system. And really, you'll see, they are just another process on a Unix system. Um, they boot like that. 
if you call anything in a container booting, because you're not really booting. All you're doing is starting up a process in a namespace, and it goes. You don't necessarily have an init or, God help you, systemd. Welcome to the new world. Um, systemd, you don't have a cron or a syslog or any of those things. You can, but for the most part, most people just run a single process or maybe a group of processes that are part of a service. That's the difference. They're super lightweight, they start up fast, that's the things to remember. So, what's Docker? And why would you use this thing? Um, fundamentally, this is again just me, Docker is just a bunch of set of tools. Yes, it's a company, they offer a whole bunch of stuff, but they started off open source and now they've got some really cool and very interesting tools that they're more higher level abstracted. It's an engine, fundamentally there's three components, an engine, images, and a registry. The engine is the core component. It's used to start, stop, build containers, manage them, manage the interaction between the user and the kernel, so set up namespaces, set up networking, all kinds of fun stuff. Images are, you know, I'll, I'll go over it. So the engine, really at the core, it's the Docker command and a Docker daemon, and it's a various set of tools. Command line is basically used to interact with the daemon, that's it. And the daemon is responsible for basically everything else. It interacts with the kernel, interacts with IP tables, interacts with file system. It's got a whole bunch of set of drivers, but it's it's fairly trivial. It's actually pretty small. And uh, I believe it's all in Go, if I remember correctly. So the entire thing is in Go. It's single executable, which is kind of fun. Um, that's at the core, fundamentally, what the Docker engine is. You'll see me going through this a lot. Um, there is no web interface to this thing. There actually are, but they're the commercial. There's some open source people that actually wrote stuff to interact with their Docker API, because all the CLI is using is just using the API. It's using it over a, a Unix domain socket in this case, but you can actually have it be listening on TCP, and you can do it remotely and all kinds of fun stuff. For the purpose of this demo and just to kind of get, keep this a little bit simple, I'm just using it locally. Um, and it's just the Docker command, and then there's a whole set of subcommands. So the, the, the ones that we're going to cover is like running a container, executing, which I'll explain later, PS to show what containers are running, a whole bunch of Im images, inspecting stuff, checking out the network, and playing with volumes, which we'll look at later. So I have a lot of stuff on Docker images. So images are the fundamental building block for Docker. A lot of people, this is why they get into this, because you can take an image, and I can run it on here, and then I can give you the image, and you can run the exact same thing over there, or over there, or in this cloud, or in that cloud, and that cloud, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have an Ansible cookbook, or a chef cookbook, or puppet this, and have all these things. Here's your self-contained thing, go. It basically consists of a, multiple layers, You'll see what I'm talking about here with a, an image at the end. Um, the layers are stacked together using various storage drivers. And then when they're all stacked together, they present themselves a root file system for the container. Remember how we talked about namespaces beforehand? This is fundamentally what it's doing. It's taking a whole bunch of small layers. Those, those layers consist, consist of a base image and then some updates and some other updates and some other updates. Either you did it or somebody upstream did it. And then it takes all those, sees all the different holes in between them, smushes it down to basically a union file system and presents that union file system to the container through a, uh, a map. Um, all of those base layers are read-only, so you can't really touch anything. So what, 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 so what, what does that mean? How do, you, how do you write stuff? Well, it creates this thin read-write container layer which actually sits all the way up to the top of the stack. And it uses copy on write semantics for when you're making changes. So if you go in there and mess with, uh, you get a user lib and you want to replace, or even better, open SSL vulnerability in your container. Yes, that can happen. Don't think you can't. You get into your container, and I'll show you how, and you do a yum update open SSL. It's going to go and do its thing, and it's going to come down. And all those bits that it writes down to that file are going to go in the container layer. So when you You've overwritten your base stuff, but it's still, all those other pieces, bits are still written down in some other layers, just yours is the most concurrent. So when you turn off that container and you turn it back on, that container layer 
is critical for you to continue functioning because you've made some changes to it. We'll talk about how to get around some of those issues later. Um, so I'll copy on write. Now what's fun is you can commit your layers. <laughs> so you can actually get into your container, do a yum update, finish it, get out, and basically say docker commit and commit that container layer into the rest of the stack, at which point it does the math, creates a new layer, puts it on the stack, and then creates a new container read-write layer, put, makes it read-only, and puts a new read-write layer on top of it, and then if you make more changes to that, you can commit them. And it, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. I don't really use it that way, because I'm, I'm not, it's not, not really, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I'd rather just tear it all, I kind of approach this as a Phoenix project kind of thing. I'll, just, I'll tear down the entire container, set up a new one, tag it differently, and just deploy a new one. So that's, that's kind of the approach. So this is kind of what I was talking about. You can see, you know, this is an example of a Ubuntu 15.04. You've got the base layer. They're all identified with a cryptographic hash at this point. And then somebody did something, probably some minor updates, added it, committed it, and then they did something else and added it, committed it, and then, you know, this zero byte later, who knows, probably someone touched an M time or an A time somewhere and committed it for some reason. And then your, when you actually do a run, you've got this thin read-write layer right on top, so everything that you do within the container gets written there. So um, an example, I didn't really write it down. So if your application does some logging to a file system, it's gonna probably be logged into you know, some directory hierarchy. All your logs are gonna be written to this thin layer here. If you accidentally get rid of your container, like delete it, the thin layer goes with it this entire stack goes bye-bye. So you need to be a little weary about what you're doing. Yes? Is this uh, happening to like sequential blocks or to files or directories? I believe it's block. Uh, no, it's a union file system. It's files. Some interesting and fun things. Uh, a whole bunch of containers can actually use the same base image. So this whole chunk is read-only, so it doesn't matter. So I can deploy one container VM that's based on this base image, and then I can deploy two, three, four, six of them, whatever, all on the same machine. I don't need six copies of the same thing. They're all going to be referencing this, these same read-only layers. So kind of an advantage versus VMs in some cases. So if you're going to deploy a VM, like KVM or something like that, you're going to have a VMD or a, a virtual disk for this guy, virtual disk for this guy, virtual disk for this guy. Yes, they're thin, so you're not going to use the entire mess, but you're going to have a bunch of copies of the same thing. And to get rid of that, you know, you're going to have a file system that does dedupe and all kinds of fanciness underneath there. In this case, it kind of does it for you because all the base images are the same. You're not writing anything new. Um, all of the images are stored on the Docker host. That will come to kick you in the butt later on, but you'll see. Um, there are all of this interaction between the host and the containers with respect to storage is all pluggable. So they have storage drivers. There's a whole bunch of them. The default for Ubuntu is AUFS. For CentOS and Red Hat, it's Device Mapper. I have no idea who's using ButterFS for these things by default. There's an overlay file system. Uh, somebody added a ZFS driver, so you can actually do that as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, if you go to the Docker storage driver page, you'll see all the different ones and some of their advantages. Some of these actually have very, very significant advantages. Today, we're going to be messing with Device Mapper. It has some very significant disadvantages. The copy on write semantics for Device Mapper are kind of terrible. Um, but for what I'm doing with it for myself, it's fine. There are other better ways to do it, and they actually have a whole section on the Docker documentation that go over the advantages and disadvantages of the different drivers. If you're doing a distributed, like if you have multiple Docker hosts and you're doing this in production, you want to deploy multiple images all over the place, you can actually use there's some drivers that can talk to a different daemon that can basically say, oh, plug this virtual disk in here and get access to it. And then if you need to stop that container and restart it somewhere else, it will automatically know that, oh, that container has been registered with this disk. And they'll interact with each other to either copy the container image over or it's stored on some shared storage device, and you can go from there. 
we might talk about that a little bit at the end when we start talking about the orchestration pieces, um, but we'll see. This is not hard. You can create your own Docker images. It's actually really trivial, and we probably will do one. One of my demos at the end is we're going to go do a Docker build, and we're just going to do it. Um, Docker files are really straightforward. Um, you can also just pull images from a public or private registry. Today, we will be pulling for the public registry. Uh, Docker runs the, did I put it? Yeah, next one, registry. Um, if you're an enterprise and you don't want to ship your stuff, you can run a registry locally, private. You can sign your containers, this is a big deal. Um, you can verify signature, you can verify integrity, you can verify that you're actually talking to the private, you can do all kinds of fun things with private registries. Um, you can do some of those with the public registry with Docker Hub, but not all of them. Uh, in the public registry, specifically the Docker Hub, hub.docker.com, um, they, they kind of follow this uh, naming pattern for images. It's username, slash, the name of the application, and then a colon and some tags. Some people use tags for version number. Some people use tags for a whole slew of other things. It's totally up to them. And I might show you one of the Docker Hub pages that actually, the, what, what I mean for that. Um, you'll, if you ever go to the Hub and you start doing a search for something, like if you search for CentOS or if you search for Ubuntu, you'll notice that the username is not there. That means that's an official image. That means somebody from Ubuntu official or CentOS official created that image and said, talk to Docker, make sure their credentials are handshaked, and everybody's all cool, and they said, this is it. This is, this is the official Docker image that we want to give you. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so yeah, the, the example down, that I have down at the bottom is sometimes you'll see a CentOS, and I'll show you what that looks like. Or sometimes, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that basically repackage CentOS. <laughs> they actually base their image based on the official CentOS, but they might have made some changes. They just, for whatever reason, they, they want to make some changes. Um, Docker Hub, public registry, hub.docker.com. You can search for it either through the web interface or you can do a Docker search. I'll show you what it looks like. And then you can basically pull the image down. By default, when you install Docker on your machine, I didn't go over how to install this. It's, they've got way better documentation than I could ever write. Um, you're, you basically, you're going to do a search either on the web interface or through a CLI, and you find something, and you say Docker pull and the name of the image. And if, but like I said, by default, you're connected to the Docker Hub. You can make some environment changes, or you can m mess with your Docker RC to basically say a private registry, and if you need to authenticate to it, you can set some stuff in it. But for the most part, I'm just going to talk about Docker Hub. And then it will pull down all the layers for that image. And I'm not going to really show that here, because some of the images are pretty big, and it might take two or three minutes. But I'll, I'll start one off just to kind of show you. Alpine's pretty small, so that's, that's not, not too bad. So. Let's show some commands. Everybody likes demos, right? Can you even read that? I can try to ambiguify. Uh, change the signs. Terminal. Aha. Yes, let us make it 20 points. We will double you. Bam. Better? Readable? Legible? Cool. All right. So there's the Docker command. Gives you a whole bunch of stuff down here, options, what, whatnot. Um, usually the first thing I do. Docker PS shows me the list of Docker containers that are actually running, uh, kind of like a regular PS does, but you know, this is for Docker. Notice that there's nothing, but in reality, I actually do have some stopped containers. So just like with PS AUX or Fade, I want to do a dash A for show me all. Oh look, there's stuff. God, that did not wrap well. Um, so you'll have a container ID, big, usually a, a subset of the entire hash, the UID. The image that it's actually based on from the Docker Hub. Um, God, this is so painful. 
Yeah, that's fine. It's easy to read. You can see what command is the entry point. That's actually what it runs by default. Um, when it was created, what the status was when it exited, and then the name that I gave it when I actually created the, the thing. So that's kind of what it is. Uh, is the command that it runs? When you start it up by default. And you'll see, yeah, when you do a Docker run and a name of a thing. It's the closest thing it has to. Yeah, pretty much. Um, a lot of people are actually using the term entry point. Um, some are not, like this guy for the Nihilus stuff, S successv scan or whatever. It might just been. It does. The new ones do. Some of these are 1.9 images that have not been updated. So this Docker changes quickly. <laughs> There's no such thing as staying still. What you learned today, uh, next release I think is like in three weeks, may not be the same then. And they keep updating everything and it's really fast changes. When I first started playing with this, they didn't have the notion of named volumes. It was just, to, you know, you can just, we'll get there. You can do map. Now there's named volumes. Even before that, there was no such thing as named networks. You just map did a whole bunch of other manipulation. Now there's named networks. It's It changes quickly. And they're only on 1.11 right now, so you get, get used to it. Okay, so that's Docker PS. Um, Docker images will show you all the images that I've got. So I've got you know some Apache stuff that we're going to do later. I've got the default, the official CentOS, the official Alpine Linux, which is a tiny little guy. Um, I was messing with Splunk, and I've got, and I did this intentionally, I've got two different versions of MySQL. Well, they're actually the same, but yeah. Um, as you can see by the image ID, they just were pulled differently. One, I explicitly asked for 5.7. The other one is the latest, which that's just what it was. I can update these, so I can ask it to refresh the image, and then I'll just pull the differential layers. And of course, I also have this, so. That's what images. Um, I don't have any differentials. Oh man, I should have done that. If you do an images a, if you pulled newer versions of the image, the latest version will be whatever. It'll show you the name, but it'll also show you some of the other layers in between, and they'll just be named some crazy ID or the, the actual container image ID uh, layer name ID, so it's just kind of interesting, but whatever. Can't show you that today. All right, so let's actually run a container and just run bash in it. So we're going to do a docker exec dash i for interactive dash t for allocate me a tty. Um, I'm not going to give her a name because it doesn't matter. Actually, it will. I'm going to give it a name, and we're going to call it uh, Gator Bash. That's a bad idea, but whatever. Um, and then we're going to say, use the CentOS image. Ready? We're going to do. Oh, you can't. You can't. Can't do a name with. Yeah, I do. It'll run the entry point. Which for CentOS is Bash, but yeah. Uh, really? Oh, sorry, exec. I wanted to run Docker command. Is it command? Yeah, yeah, I can just do a run. So there we are. We're in our container. Crazy host name, huh? Everybody loves it. What the what? That's all I got. Whoops. Sorry. Got excited. I'm rude. Hmm, that's cool. What can I do? <laughs> uh, you know, I could go look around and do all kinds of stuff, but, you know, I'm root in a thing that has... No other process. What? What is this? <laughs> um, proc is there. We can look him out. It's got a whole bunch of the regular stuff that you'd expect from a CentOS type image. But what? What? Why is Etsy host name mounted here? And what? What is? That's kind of weird. Look at all this C group stuff, and it's basically 
mapping system D and all kinds of fun stuff. And my slash is what is that crazy thing? It's I'm I'm doing some interesting stuff with device mapper. But yeah, you're you're inside. I mean I can cap proxy PU info and that's the same thing as what you would see outside. Um, it thinks it's got the entire box because I didn't resource limit it with Docker Run. Now the default CentOS doesn't have it, but so um, yum, install net. It's not even there on the default. Yeah, I, I was messing with this earlier. I was like, really? Okay, fine. So I'll install the net tools. Yeah, just sign it. Cool, all right, so now what? Let's go look what we have. We got an E0, that's an interesting IP. And we got a loopback, okay. What's my route look like? Default gateway is dot one, and I've got some other network near me. That's interesting, but you know, it feels and looks like a regular thing, and I can actually full on just, what I just did right there with the yum install, it wrote to the container layer. So this is actually a good example. I'm gonna leave now, I'm gonna hit exit. Now I'm back on my host, as you can see by my, by my prompt. If we do a Docker PS, oh, it's gone. Uh, uh, no, it's not gone. Uh, where's that name? There it is, Gator Bash. So that's the container, it's just in the background. All right, it, it stopped, it's not running. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of it. So there is a command, docker, rm, and then you give it the name of your thing. Bye-bye. So we go to ps-a, it's gone. Let's run this again. Uh-oh. Where is it? It's gone. I got rid of my container. So it got rid of my container layer. It's all gone. Any changes that I made, peace be with you. So I'm going to get rid of it. So just something to note if you ever mess with that kind of, or do that, just know that that happens. So there's other stuff that you can do. So let me start my, there's a MySQL instance here. Do, do, do. So, yes. Um, on those accident things, what else is... What else is in existence other than the this container? We'll get to some of that later. Okay. You can do persistence and map. The, the the surprise is you can actually map directories inside the container to directories on the host, and that way they're persistent. And we're actually going to use that later on. Um, so I I started up my MySQL thingy, and now I can do a Docker exec. So this execs a command within my container. So now I'm in my container and you'll notice there's a container ID and they modified my host name to be that. I don't know if I have configs on here, it's not. Man. Oh, they, okay, so they left it in here. So this guy has a different IP address. 17.2, um, and yes, that will change. Um, but that's that's it. But if we look in this guy, oh look, there's a MySQL Dean. That's the only other thing running, as far as I can tell. Um, if I do a DF, it'll show me some stuff. This is the fun thing here. So var lib MySQL has actually been mapped to an external mount point, and I'm using LVM here, so it's actually just showing the logical volume that it's actually, mount, the, the block device logical volume on the other side, um, which is kind of fun and interesting to see. And when I exit here, it doesn't actually exit, it's just stopping, because I did a Docker exec, it just left my shell. So I'm gonna, and then you can use Docker stop to stop your instances and then, not Fokker, uh, Docker, PS, yeah, okay, they're not running. So um, that's the, the long and short of it. Let me show you what an image looks like or what, what it looks like. So I'm gonna do a Docker RMI, remove image, and I'm gonna get rid of Alpine Linux because it's actually pretty small. 
and it deleted the base and some other, or the two chunks of it. So there it is. And then I'm going to just pull Alpine. And it was that small. Oh, what? It still thinks it exists? Yeah, it's pretty small. It's only four megs. It's not orphaned. Okay. So, yeah, that was not a very good example. Um, I don't want to go fetch it, but it'll be, it'll show you, like, a little pretty moving picture for downloading this layer, downloading this layer, downloading this layer, and it'll show it in there. Um, by default, out of the box, Red Hat and CentOS use the device mapper, and they use a loopback file to do... That's where they keep all the images. So normally, under var lib docker, there's a... Yeah, should be coming. Yeah. Our lab. Um, those are tiny files. Those aren't act the actual. Those are actually. Let me see. It's a directory. It's hard to tell. <clears throat> Normally, in the under the containers, those are the UUIDs of the, the actual running containers. You would have a file in here, which is actually loopback mounted through the device mapper to give you the root file system. I decided to not use the loopback thing because it was uh, arguably very, very, very slow. Um, it was actually giving me quite a lot of pain when I was doing updates to images. It was taking forever. So I follow the directions, and I am now using, you can just use Docker info, and it will tell you what all the default things are. And I'm actually using the storage driver, but I'm using a pool, a little LVM thin pool to do all the mapping. So when it's actually downloading the container images or the, the file system components, it's using the device mapper raw to shove all the file system images into a logical, a thin pool, and it just uses, the, then it asks the device mapper to take this image and this image and this image and create a UnionFS on top of it and then present it. It's a lot faster to do that. Um, still not so good when it comes to uh, a copy on write, but much better than using the loopback driver. You could read more on the Docker thing. Um, and there's another command for you is, oh, I'm gonna get in there. Docker info, give you all kinds of fun and interesting information. Ugh, it wrapped around. Yeah, I'm not helping. Um, it'll give you, you know, what version of Docker you're running, 111.2, what store driver you're using. I'm not using any crazy bridging right now. It'll, all kinds of fun stuff. So, those are a bunch of Docker commands. So let's go back to our fun stuff. <clears throat> Docker and networking. So I kind of showed it off already, but yeah. Um, in, it's a little weird. You can do this a whole bunch of different ways. The default way is basically using what they call the bridging driver. There's a whole slew of different drivers. You can use overlays, you can use bridges. They've got some interesting integration now with open v switch there's a whole bunch of crazy stuff you can do with networking but basically the plug in a whole bunch of different network drivers um, with the bridge driver which is the default one it bridges the ethernet device that the container sees to a virtual ethernet device on the host which is bridged to a uh, docker zero bridge which is then <laughs> using IP tables, which I'll show you in a second, putting stuff out. So it's the default. So what does it do? If you don't specify anything to Docker run, you can actually do these things. You can create your own network and specify IP ranges and all the fun stuff. Um, it by default creates a slash 16 network. Yes, that's it does create a big ass network in somewhere in the 17 slash eight space. Um, you can do a Docker network inspect, which I'll show you in a minute to show you what the bridge looks like. Uh, you can create your own 
By default, if you don't specify a network, your uh, container is going to get attached to the default, which is the bridge network, and go there. Now, why would you want to create more networks? Well, if you've got a con they're all in this, that same 17 slash 8. So they're all layer 2 adjacent to each other. They can all talk directly to each other in kind of weird ways. Um, if you have a container that shouldn't be talking to another container, or you're, you're doing multi-tenancy, you can create a network for this customer and a network for this customer, and they can only talk to amongst themselves. They can't talk back out. Well, they can talk back out. Um, but then you need to allow their bridges to talk to each other. And it, we'll, I'll show you an example of that later on with my two-tier uh, example. But you can link two different containers networks together so they can actually talk to each other across the network boundaries. Um, containers get an IP assigned on their ETH0. That ETH0 is linked to a VETH, which I'll show you in a second. Um, then that VETH is bridged to a Docker0 virtual network adapter. And then uh, the, doc, the Docker Zero is a bridge to the rest of the world, or to the, the rest of the machine. So again, if you want to isolate stuff. So how do they get access to outside of the box? Clearly, you want these things to do something. You want you know people to send traffic to them, or vice versa. IP tables to the rescue. <laughs> when you do a Docker run, it in there's a driver, the network driver, the default bridge driver injects a chain into the forward, the default forward chain that then it mangles and does some stuff with. I will show you that in a minute. You can also do, so when you do a Docker run, you can specify dash P, which is port forwarding, and you basically say on this, the Docker host port 80, incoming requests on Docker host port 80, I want you to send those to this specific container, and it should show up on maybe 80, maybe 8080, whatever port you want to do it on. And I'll, I'll show you an example when we do a demo at the end. So this is kind of a picture. I stole this from somebody. Thanks, somebody. Um, but basically, I mean, you, you can see each of the containers have their own ETH0. This is it's not a very good example because it's a single network, but whatever. There's a VETH at the Docker host, which is they're bridged to Docker Zero, which is also on the same subnet. And then you've got IP tables getting stuff out. So I'm going to stop real quick, and we'll go back here. So um, Docker network list. God. <sighs> Sorry. Sometimes they do list something, whatever. All right, so I've got three networks, a bridge network, a host network, and none. So and remember, the bridge network is the one by default. Do I have anything wrong right now? No, good. So if I do an if config a, I've got the Docker zero, which is that piece there. I don't have any VEs because I don't have anything running. This is my physical device. And to complicate things, because I don't just run Docker on here, I also have KVM images and VirtualBox images. The physical device, EM1, that's actually my physical network device. I have a bridge so that I can use the bridge device if I need to plug in uh, virtual, or if I need to have a KVM image or something else running on here. Normally, it would just be EM1. So um, if anybody's ever done anything with BR code, it shows you the bridge status. You see that BR0 is my default bridge. That's to my outside world. It's mapped to EM1. And then Docker0 has nothing. Well, let's add something to it. Docker start. Let's start my MySQL image. And let's do show. Oh, look. Docker 0 now has this VETH interface. I don't know how that a minute ago. Oh, look. There it is. So it's bridged. Any traffic that that guy sends is bridged back to the, to the host. And it comes in on the Docker 0 network. So what happens if you... Network. God. What happens if I want another one? Well, it's not that hard. Uh, Docker network create. I'm going to call it lugnet. Yeah. By default, I didn't specify a driver, so it creates it as a bridge, bridge network. So if we do network ls, oh, look, we've got 
a network called Lugnet, and it's bridging. Um, there's a new bridge name. I didn't specify a, a name for it, so it just created one. They love you UIDs all over the place. Um, there's no interfaces bound to it, and if I do an IF config, there it is. And it's in a different network. Notice how it's the 172.18, and the Docker zero is 172.17. It just picked the next one. You can give it options. So Docker network, you can give an IP range. You can tell it internal only. You can have an IPAM driver that will do IP allocation for you. There's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do. Have fun. You're on your. Um, I'm just messing around with this at this point, but yeah, it's it's you can do all kinds of stuff. I'm going to leave that network there, and I'll show you why later. So that's kind of what networking looks like. Now my my image is running. So let's take a look at IP tables. So, God, that is way bigger than I care, but whatever. Okay. Do do do. There's my forward rule. Right up top. It jammed in these two, so you got a Docker isolation. Never mind that for right now. Um, and then they added a chain. You know, anything that hits this, hit the Docker chain. And we'll go down. Oh. I'm not forwarding anything. This is a terrible, terrible example. Uh, hold on. Uh, which one am I forwarding stuff on? doing it now these are all internal uh, let me go to a different host real quick and nah, never mind normally you'd see a forward table in there um no nah, i really do want to show you this okay hold on i have to go to my workstation yes and i will ssh to my remote thing in the cloud. Do I have anything running here? I do, okay. So um, I've got two images, two, two containers running here, uh, Grafana and InfluxDB. I am doing some port forwarding here. So port 3000 of this host, which is Docker 1, is going to 3000 in the container. And also 8083, 8086 are going there. So if we look at IP tables, oh yeah, that would you know, be useful. Um, same thing, Docker and Docker isolation, and then you'll see here. So there you go. Um, as part of the forward chain, if it's TCP, the destination port is, that's 8083, don't ask, it's you know, weird. Um, it'll send it to 17.02, and those are the InfluxDB instance, and that's the Grafana instance. And we can see that if we do a Docker inspect uh, Grafana. This gives you JSON output of what's actually running. And we can go down, 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 down. Where are you? Oh, there it is. So I'll show them. Port 3000 from the host is being sent in. You can actually bind it to a specific IP on the host as well. So if you have a host with you know, 10, 12 different IPs, you can say this specific IP and this port being sent to this container. So, all right, let's get out of my Azure instance there. Nope. Oh, one more. So we're back here. Just got my SQL. Um, I'll have more example of some how you link their networking later on, specifically with my SQL. So persistence. So as you saw earlier, we created a Docker image. We yum updated or yum, yum installed some net tools for CentOS, and then we got rid of it, and then we created a new container, and everything was gone. Well, that's because the read write image at the top went bye bye. Um, so. It's a bad thing. Sometimes it's expected. And sometimes that's actually what you want. But if you're running something like MySQL, 
where you actually want to keep that data, um, you, you probably want to map it to something more permanent. So there is this idea of volumes. And just like everything Docker, volumes are pluggable. <laughs> uh, and there's a volume driver. We're using the default volume driver, which is local, um, for obvious reason. Uh, there are a ton of different drivers out there that will do fun things with volumes. Um, one that I was looking at last night was called Flocker. And there's a, the Flocker daemon itself. You configure it to go talk to Flocker, and you can have a whole bunch of different hosts that basically the example is, let's say you got like 10 hosts and they all have NFS access to some shared file system. Um, the Flocker daemon itself is basically used to uh, tell which host where the disk is for that container. So when you do a Docker run, you specify, or you do a Docker volume create, you tell it, you use a Flocker driver, and you create it some, some name, and then it goes off the Flocker dam and says, hey, I need an image created. Could you do that for me? Or I need a, a volume created and specify the size and all that fun stuff. So that's cool. It goes off and figures out where it needs to put it and creates a VMDK or creates a, a loopback file or a whole bunch of other stuff. And it says, okay, I got it. Here's the information about it. it. Hands back a JSON object to the thing. And then when you do a Docker run, you can specify a volume and it will say, the, the name of the volume is like Flocker, or you specify the driver and they say Flocker colon and then the name that you created and it will go talk to the Flocker name and say, hey, I need this thing called this. And it says, cool, it's over here. And it says, gives it a file path that's over NFS in this case, and then they use the loopback driver to go. If you had, you can do a whole bunch of other stuff with the with, uh, Flocker. You can use iSCSI LUNs. If you had a shared uh, block device, you can do that as well. It's kind of weird, but you can do it. There's a whole bunch of interesting ways that you can map volumes. But the idea is you can have permanent, you can have data that lives in these things that will survive past either the container dying or the host dying. In our case, I'm actually doing it so that just so that the container can, or, yeah, the container can die. The host, not so much. Um, so you can back up the host just like you normally would. And in my case, that's fine. Depending on the environment that you're in, you might want to do something else. Remember that? Just, just so that you remember, just go bye bye. And actually, the, yeah, your whole thing go bye bye. So you want some persistence. So with the Docker run command, you can also specify a dash V to basically say, I want to map a volume. And you can basically say, I want to map the host volume to the container volume. So it's dash V, directory hierarchy on the host, colon, directory hierarchy in the container. No big deal. Um, if, the, if you run a Docker RM or a Docker RMI later on the, or sorry, a Docker RM on the container, you lost the container layer, so if you did anything outside of what's been mapped, yeah, it's gone, but the majority of your stuff is going to be in the things that you've mapped on purpose. So then you can later on say, oh, I, I really do need that. I've got a new version of something, or this is actually one of the examples that I've seen is I, I want to run it in tests. Cool. Take that directory hierarchy or sync it to another directory hierarchy and then map that into a different container that is basically the same software or something else. So a uh, good example is uh, I'm doing a MySQL upgrade, and I know there's going to be ISAM database level changes because it happens. So you might as well take a new container, copy, stop the, stop the first container, make a copy of the thing, restart your first one, and then start a new one with a newer version with that thing and have it do its regular upgrades and all that fun stuff. And that way, you know, you you're confident that you can actually do it over and over and over again. Um, you can also <laughs> map the same directory in the host to multiple containers. Just like you can share container images amongst containers, you can share host container directories amongst multiple containers. And you can specify that those things are either read-write or read-only. Um, an interesting but kind of silly example is, well, not so silly. Let's say you have a CDN. You've got some base set of stuff that you're going it, to, it's mostly a static website, whatever, but you need to have it in 
tons of different places, and you want to scale up. Single web server, you know, multi-thread, you can't, you're not going to be able to get all the throughput from the machine. So say, okay, I'm going to run four containers on this box, four containers on that box, four containers on that, that box, done. And then I've got more than enough throughput in different zones, all that kind of fun stuff. Back at home, your developers are making updates to this stuff, and they say, okay, I'm ready to go. You can then have them hit a button that pushes that out to essentially a red and blue kind of environment for where you're going. They say, okay, we're going to publish this to the blue environment because we're running the red environment, and then hit another button that says flip-flop them. Well, okay, so what do we do now? Bring up more containers that are using the blue and the, the, the red environment, because that's where they just pushed it to, and turn off the ones that were using the blue environment. For about 10, 15 seconds, you might have mixed match of content, but you never went down and you made an atomic change to all your stuff. So one fun example. Sorry, I got into DevOps, but no. So um like I said, there's tons of volume drivers. Go look at the Docker stuff. Flocker is one example. There's plenty of others. Um, they're very interesting when you start wanting to do something much more reliable with Docker. Right now, I'm just messing with it. For work, we're going to get serious, but that's different thing. Now on to we're actually going to do some stuff. So first example, we're just going to do a simple static website. So if you noticed earlier, I have pulled a an image. I, I don't. I think it's Ubuntu. Yeah, I think it's it's based on Ubuntu. And it's just an Apache server. I think they actually have PHP and a whole bunch of stuff on there too. Um, I did it by doing this, and it gave me back a whole bunch of stuff. I was like, oh, that's cool. Didn't give me a whole lot of info. Um, so then I I went and proceeded. Get out of this for a second. I went to hub, hub, and then I was like, okay, Q, what do we got? I said, what do we got? A slow network connection. Yeah. Nope, I typed too early. And I looked through these and like, okay, and it's had three stars, 10,000 pulls, whatever, let's just go look at it. Um, and they basically don't give you much information, but I was like, okay, let's just mess with this. So I, so I, I dropped the mic. Um, so I, I pulled it just to make it easier. Um, and then I was like, okay, well. Uh, it's not running right now. So let's create it. I'm going to do a Docker run, dash D says, in the background, um, we're gonna call it Gator Web. And anybody remember what the name of the image was? Yeah, that's it. Put that back. Do 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 do. Okay, did a thing. Notice how I didn't map any drives. I didn't map anything. I didn't map any networking. This thing is running, but it's totally inaccessible to me. Um, we can, is it exec? Yeah. Keep doing that. We can go into it just like the others, and see what's going on. It's like, oh, look at all this. They actually did something a little bit more sane. They've got something called Supervisor D. I will go and let you read about it, but it is essentially a way for you to have an init within, doc, within containers. Because sometimes you actually want, I don't know, a real syslog to run in there and follow files, or you want it to have syslog watch a file and send it off box. You don't want to map var log, or you want to do something else interesting. Um, in this case, they're actually doing that so that they can run a syslog and uh, fast CGI daemon for PHP. So, but again, oh. 172.17.03 is the IP of this thing. Let me get out of that. 
And there's the, this is the Docker chain. Let's go down. There's nothing here. So this guy is, I can't get to him. There's nothing there. So let's go ahead and do this. We're going to do Docker stop gator web. And then I'm going to toss it. Docker RM. And then this time, whoops, that's the exec. I'm going to take dash P. And I take 8080 on the outside and shove it to port 80 on the inside. Done. Notice how it's telling us here. And there it is. There's the Docker chain telling us it's going to shove that in. So let's go to our fancy web browser and. I go to port 8080, there's our thing. So what, what is that actually doing? I happen to know that this container, um, let me get my exec again. I happen to know that this container, oh, I'm in the container again, is doing stuff in this directory. Slash app is the default document root. So, oh crikey's. They've got, that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> So there's that. There we are. There's your, did something. Um, so then we'll get out of that. We'll stop Gator Web and it's gone or it stopped. Huh? If you the minute you hit enter, it said it's like a loss. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I stopped it, and it's no longer running. It's gone. Just a quick question. If you don't RM the, uh, the, the container, the container does the does that persistence layer continue to stay yep. there? It stays there until I get until rid of the container. Commit to it or commit it or remove it? Exactly. Um, so, well, let's we, we want to be able to maintain this thing. So before I came, I created a directory called export gator log doc root. And we've got a little thing that says, hi there, from the host. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this thing again, same ports, but I'm going to say that export gator log doc root should be mapped to app. Run this thing. Do, 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 do. There it goes. So we'll go back here. Reloading the page out of there from the host. And we, I can show you that it actually does talk group. It's real. That's how you get persistence. So I can RM this thing again make some more changes, start it up again, give it a totally different name. It doesn't really matter what the hell it is. It gets mapped in there. If you can find, if you don't like this container for how it does Apache and you can find a different one where there's a document root, sure, use that one. Test, always test. But yeah, use that one if it makes sense. Do whatever, whatever you want. But you basically have persistence outside the mess. So that's this is the first one. Let me stop that. Um, Get rid of it. Okay. Gone. All right. And of course, this will fail eventually. Let's close this thing. Yeah, this one. So that's, you know, simple, static, but it shows you how to map volumes, how to port forward, the whole deal. Let's go on to something that's more of a two-tier application, and this will show you some of the fun networking junkies. Let's kill that. Okay, so again, we just have the MySQL instance and nothing else going. I did a terrible thing. And I pulled a PHP my admin container to this machine, just so that I can show you what this looks like. But please don't use PHP my admin anywhere. Um, because it's a security issue. We yeah. like rootkits on the server. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I pulled 
one called PHP my admin, PHP my admin, whatever. So be it. So what I'm gonna do, I did not test this earlier, but we're gonna play with it now. Um, so we've got, oh God, it's not us. Um, we've got a couple of different networks. So I'm gonna do a Docker run dash D name log admin. Uh, we're gonna shove it into the network called log net. We are going to link it There's this, yeah. Yeah, that's the command for this one. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, I'm not bridging their two networks. I'm actually specifically saying link these two together. Um, and then, what was it? PHP my admin. Oop, I forgot to put networking in here too. So we're gonna take HP. 80, 80 on the outside to 80 on the inside. Yeah, for Pete's sake. Like I said, we're doing this live. What did I miss? This is what I did earlier, but I didn't involve a separate network. Is it dash dash net? Oh, okay. Dash dash net. Sorry. There you go. So it's running. Let's see if this worked. God help me, there's PHP my admin. <laughs> and I know Oh, I failed to link it. Uh, I did this earlier. So what it's telling us is it can't by default the PHP my admin deployment that they have here, it's looking for a, um, a host named DB. And what the link thing does that I did there is it injects a host name into Etsy hosts in the container with the IP address of the other guy. And it also sets up IP tables appropriately so it can get to it. Well, I hope it has set up IP tables appropriately. I don't know if it actually did. I don't think it bridged the two networks. Well, find out in a second. Um, so let me stop the... I'll run it the way that I did beforehand, just, just make it easier. I don't know why stopping a simple PHP my admin takes this long, but it did, and I was really confused by that earlier. There we go. So we'll do, I'll go back to what I was doing beforehand. I just created something called my admin. And the, with the link command, what I'm basically doing is saying that the container named MySQL should be linked to the inside the host name, inside the container of the host name named DB. So I'll just do that for now. And we'll go back over here. Um, And this time it worked. And MySQL is not actually currently exposed on the network. There's, it's only inside the box. It's on the Docker. It's only on the host. Yeah, it's not on the bridge network to the campus network because this is a workstation underneath my machine at work. But it's only within the box. 
So the, the VETH devices are there. It happens to be in this case that the two VETHs are on the same layer two network. They're all they're both on the probably the 17 7, or 172 17 network. Um, but I, I basically told Docker that you know when you go inside, whenever PHP does a get at or info or DNS lookup for DB, it's an Etsy host, so it knows that that's over there, and it, it's assuming that it's on 3306 like it normally would. So now it's going kind of sideways through the bridge to get to the other guy. And that's basically how that works. So you can have two tier applications where it's better than a firewall because you're never exposing SQL to the outside world. That's another reason for doing the separate networks. So you can actually kind of use them as a DMZ and other kind of fun stuff. You can basically say, this network over here is never to leave the room. And this one is the public network. So you can kind of do that on the same thing. You can pull off the same sort of thing with VMs, of course. But this is just how you would do it here. And it's a very interesting and fun way to do it. So uh, go bye-bye. See, again, why? It's freaking PHP my admin. So there we go. The last example is we're going to build our own image. We're not going to do much with it because I didn't spend too much time on this. But um, uh, did I put on? Oh, I'm root. OK. I was messing with. Let's on. I was messing with Alpine Linux, and I wanted to create a container that does both DHCP, TFTP, and, and a tiny little web server. Um, but I really, you know, I, I never really finished it. I'm still playing around with it. <clears throat> but to create a Docker image for yourself, you've got a thing that's a Docker file. Um, there are you know, commands that you run. That's what the from is. You're saying from, I, mean, I want to pull in from Alpine latest. So that's your base image that you're referencing this on. You specify your maintainer, because if you actually want to commit this back to Docker Hub, it uses that information. The run command is while it's building. So while it's building, APK is uh, Alpine package. I'm going to tell it to not cache any of the stuff that it's going to do. And I want it to add TFTP, HPA, and GenX, and DACP. And then I want it to copy the entry point SH that I've got in this directory into the container. And I'm telling it the specific entry point, the default entry point for this container is run entry. So if we'll just quickly look at entry point SH. That's all it does. I'm alive, and then it exit once. So when I run this thing, it's not going to live very long because it exit once. But we're, we're going to change it to basically sleep for some interval just so that we can do something. So let's do that. Don't hate me for using Nano. Um, Why do I could just leave it sitting there doing nothing, couldn't I? I, want, I was messing around with exit codes to figure out what, what the behavior from Docker was, oh, to just to see if it what it would report. if It it actually reports the exit code all the way up to Docker PS, so you can actually see oh, okay. if it exited successfully. So I was actually, when I was messing around with this, and I was I was had a, a bunch of different things, checking the file system, checking this, checking to make sure that TFTP actually installed, I was using different error code, different exit codes for this means this, this means that, and all that kind of fun stuff. So we'll just put in sleep, of course, 9,000. Um, so we got this thing. We're going to use Docker build. And I honestly can't remember the options anymore. Um, I think it's just the name, and then you do Yeah, I think it's, it's just the path to the thingy. Right, the path is just like the Docker file. Yep. Oh, let's mess with it. Docker build, Docker file, gator log test. Nope. No, you have to load the whole path. So it's with like a, a dot. Um, because then it'll load the endpoint <laughs> as well. There it is. I knew there was something weird if I just give it a, a dot. So you can see I already had Alpine. Or actually, no, I went to go fetch Alpine. 
it was, and now it's running my APK stuff, so it's actually fetching all of the uh, chunks that I asked for. All done, all done, done. And then it shoved my entry point, copied the entry point in there, and basically specified that the entry point for this thing is there. And we're done. So um, Docker images should show. Uh, yeah, it's going to have a no name because I didn't specify the name. Damn it. How do I get that thing? Well, I've got an image ID. Hold on. I'm tossing it. Yeah, you're right. Really? Yeah. So there are a ton of man pages. They're all Docker dash something. So if it's build, there you go. Um, let's pull. Dash F for the Docker path of the file. But it doesn't say how to set the name. I knew I'd, I've done this before. And naming language. Dash T. Dash T, thanks. Even though I'm not using a tag, it doesn't matter. So, where is our? Okay, shouldn't take long. It's pretty small. Let it do it again. It does its thing. Okay. And then if we do Docker images, yay, there's our image. So now we can do a Docker run, dash D, um, let's give it a name. It's running somewhere. Um, one thing I didn't show is you can actually do some logs. Log test logs. Was it not called log? Yeah, logs. Yeah, it's oh, you're right. And it basically shows standard out and standard error from the thing. So there's the I am alive. And just so that we do know it's actually running, we can actually do a Docker exec IT. Um, That's right. There's no bin bash. It's busy box. And it's not found. Yeah. So we're in. Ish. Um, it's a tiny little mess. You can see there's the entry point we put in. That's what it actually runs. Um, there's probably nothing in here. It just shows the entry point, my sleep, and the fact that I'm running a shell through BusyBox. So if we wait for 9,000 seconds, um, which is probably way too long, it'll eventually exit and we'll get a little, see how they said exited 0 or 111 or whatever it might be. You'll get the exit code back, and you can always do a Docker logs on it as well. Uh, um, Dr. Logs is also interesting. You do a tail. Um, you can specify how far back to go, but I'm not going to do it. Um, and then dash F is a follow. So it will sit here until it exits and poops out. So that's, that's that. Uh, stop. Can you show the file that generated that again? Yeah. So, rip it. 
That's it. Pretty straightforward. Shell scripts. You all can write shell scripts, right? You can do it. So, um, you can write Perl. If you can find a container that has Perl, you can run and just do a bunch of Perl. You could install Perl. Um, and if you want to see other Docker files, most of the things on the hub will tell you what their Docker file looks like. Uh, I'm trying to think of something else. This. Um, let's sort this by stars. Yeah, that's fine. They will usually tell you where the source repository is because it's usually on GitHub anyhow. And there are lots so of examples. Your documentation is to what well, they actually, ha Docker themselves have really good documentation for how to write a Docker file including style and all that other fun stuff as well. Um, but, you know, if you find a Docker container, you're like, what the f is that thing doing? There you go. The majority of them in the hub have their entire repository in, in GitHub. Why? Because the Docker hub has automated builds. When you commit your stuff and put it on there, you can say, I want you to automatically build it. And it will watch GitHub for changes. And if you commit something new, automatically rebuilds. So you know what's in that image and you also have something Yes, like yes, very much. So if you find something that's close, but you want to make a minor change to it, you can either base it on them, so you can, you know, from whatever, and that would get everything the same, and then you can run your own stuff. Instead of running their entry point, shove in your own and do your own thing. But the thing that you make, um, if it's based on something else, it's very thin, yes? Yeah, super thin. You're just... Just the minor changes that you made is another layer added on top of theirs. And the thing that you make is called an image? It's an image. It's an image on top of other images. Yeah, an image consists of a bunch of different file system layers. So you're using, like for this guy, he's using spoke base latest. So this is actually wheel. <laughs> These people do. <laughs> the core OS guys are flat out insane, by the way. Um, oh, geez. And then he's got a hub from hub base, wherever that is. Um, see, he's not even doing anything in here. This is, he's just, from that, put this maintainer. Okay, what? There's a lot of that sort of stuff in the hub. Um, let's find something that doesn't, it's not terrible. Uh, is it in, in the? Oh, it's on the hub. It's on the hub? What is it? Let's look at your terribleness. <laughs> What's the name of the image? What does it do? Do you have a README EMD? Yeah, no, it's the, the GitHub is the better one. It's okay. an Android build environment. You build Android apps with it. Basically, uh, the idea was because you have different SDKs for different apps, yeah. it, you know, just basically maintain the dependencies inside the image. Of, uh, like on some random thing. There you go. What's the, what's your oh, uh, BJORN. Uh, BJORN. Or, 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 Much yeah, kindness. That's, that's, that's how much. That's how Sandra is going to So you can see. And there's your Docker. Kind of a Docker file there. So yeah. you ganked it from CentOS 7. Good good place yeah, to start. And I used an expect script to install the uh, SDKs because there's an interactive yes now. Yeah. So I mean, he's. So that's a little bit of, of a more involved one. I'm just running a bunch of YAM commands there. And then yep. later on, I'm running YAM update SDK with like the various. There. Get w get and tar and expect and all kinds of fun stuff. But it's 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 really really straightforward and easy for what you want to do. 
And this is a perfect example of why people run containers, because installing multiple SDKs right. and developing against them is a pain in the balls. Exactly. So this is perfect use for that. I didn't. If you write files inside the container and you've got a, a hosted, you know, if you have a volume hosted or something like that, um, it's going to write those files to the host file system. Unless you do something. Unless you do something. Yeah. Right, but that's the default behavior. The default behavior, yeah. Every, you saw when I exec'd in and did bash your root on the inside, um, which means if you have a mapped volume, you're also a root on the outside. Eek! Best what a lot of people do, and they're actually getting way, way better at this. They don't run their processes as root inside the container. They'll do a user add in their entry point to actually add another user into the environment if it's not there already. And then they'll do um, they'll either use supervisor D or they'll just use sudo to execute a thing as a different user. And they're getting better at it. It's still me. It's it's hit or miss. If you're going to run any of these things, do you probably want to look at the Docker file just just to make sure? Um, but yeah, that's basically it. So, install. Like I said, it's beautiful for this kind of fun things. You saw how quickly I got PHP my admin going. I didn't have to do anything until it's over here. Bam, and you're open to the world. <laughs> just install the web shell. Good job. Um, uh, it, but realistically, I mean, if you just want to have WordPress or Drupal or any of those kind of things, drop it. Oh, I never showed environment variables. Damn it. Let's do that real quick. We're going to build something. Um, so we're going to go back to our mess. Uh, where was I? That guy. Um, when you're running, you can, oh man, is this, this thing's not going to have bash. So let's assume it's bin sh. And I'm going to say echo. Um, Should be exposed in my environment, so I'm just going to do. I'm just going to pass an environment variable called env underscore name. Right? I think that should work. We'll see. Yeah, it's just still running. Yeah. That's right. So let me find an example, and MySQL is a perfect example. So, you know, you're going to have a whole bunch of options that you want to set to MySQL. I don't know, like root password. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to create a new container based on the other container, the official container, and just modify, have a run command that basically goes in there and sets stuff to basically set the password, or uses the MySQL admin command to go mess with stuff. So what people do is you can set environment variables, and their entry point script will take that environment variable and do something useful with it. Um, usually they're documented on the Docker Hub or somewhere in their README file, but I mean, this guy's, this thing's official, so you can set the MySQL password, a random root password, a one time password, a, a whole bunch of other fun stuff. And if we, oh uh, boy, I wonder if they have their Docker file updated. I checked this a couple of days ago. Oh, no, they got it. Okay. So they've got a Docker entry point script in here. That's the script. And if we go search for 
root. There you go. They've got some other stuff, but they basically you can use passed in environment variables as variables in your run script to go do things. So that's kind of what we're doing here. I don't want to create another one. Uh, sorry, not root. What? Did I not RM? I did not. I only stopped it. Okay. Go on. Go back to me. So now with the sentry point, I didn't save. Good job, Ellie. Oh, wait. Nope, there it is. I've got, I just have a little run script. Actually, I'm, I'm not going to do it that way. Let me do this. Uh, I'm going to toss that mess. Uh, I'm going to go in here. I'm just going to go in here and say, You only get to live for two minutes. So we'll build that again. And this time, when it runs, it's going to say, hi. And then it's going to, depending on how I tell it to start up, I'm passing an environment variable in, it'll see it, and it can do stuff. So environment variables are really, really useful. That's how you pass information into the thing. So do we get it? Yep. OK. So. It'll cache the, yeah. So I was going to do that build, next. <laughs> so we're going to run it. This time I pass environment. And then we can do a stop. Yeah, I just like, I'm so used to just doing it this way. And then if we let's do it again, <laughs> sucker. That's what you get for interacting. And there you go. Just the proof that it actually does actually do something and you can pass stuff in. So. If are you using the the device mapper loop loopback? Yeah, that's the only place that it actually happens. Okay. So if I so we've got a couple of intermediaries in here that are unnamed, but the way that it does the images that say you can see that these are used by that. They're all chunks of it. Um, I'm not going to get rid of it. So what we're going to do, just to show what he was talking about, if we do if we go in here, um, it's going to build it again. Can I build it again? Just so that I know it changed. So it already knew that the chunks were already there, and it just shoved my entry point back into it and created a new one. So the, it built, it removed some intermediate container and some other intermediate, but the final container is that guy, which there it is. And you see how it got rid of the chain? With the device mapper, 
it'll smush it down when you're when you're done. But with your, when you're using the loopback driver, yeah, it's a ungodly mess. Actually, I can show you an example of that. Um, yeah, uh, I did not do that one the right way. All the containers and all the images, yeah. So people use that too. Uh, so if you do that and we do it dash a, oh man, I haven't updated anything and I haven't built anything here. Terrible example again, but this one is using a loop file. So this is actually a good example. If we go do var lib docker. If we become root and go to var lib docker, um, where are you? Oh, it's not in here. There's a different directory. Image. I believe it's in the, and those are the actual images. Is it? No. I can never remember where they hide them anymore. That's the JSON for the entire mess. Yeah, these are way too small. I can't remember where they hide the, the, the original images. Eh, I. My foreign exchange student, she's back in China. Um, I can't remember where they hide it. I'll, you can search around for it, but ah, uh, not. <laughs> she may or may not get it. There may be more pop-ups. She might try to embarrass me. No promises. Um, so, yeah, you gotta, you definitely have to do image management with Docker, just because when you do, like, if I if I decided to update one of those images, it's gonna just pull in more layers, and there's when I do a Docker images dash a, you'll see the base image and then just the layers that it needed. Actually, I wonder if I can. Do I have anything? No, those are all new. The Splunk one, maybe. Did that show up if you rebuilt your custom It did. Okay, so here you go. So it's going to pull in just the differences. I don't know how big this is, but it might be huge for all I know. Um, see it? This is the same thing that you see from regular Docker pull. It's In this case, it's not pulling the entire mess and then squishing it down, it's actually pulling in the difference layers. And we'll see, I think if we do a Docker images dash A, you'll see Splunk one and then a bunch of ones before that don't have names, but they just have the uh, container IDs. And they're all gonna be based on this mess. Actually, you might squish it. Now that I think about it, it might take all these and create an intermediary container. That's them all squished down. I can't remember what it's gonna do. Let's see. Go, go, go. Okay, so while that's going, um, so this is all fine and good for if you wanna Drupal or PHP my admin, gotta help you, or you know any of those kind of fun things. It's trivial to set up. You don't have to worry about dependencies. Don't worry about PHP versions and all that fun stuff. Patchy and all that junk. Plop it out, go, done. Read their directions. It's pretty straightforward, trivial. And then you do what you want to do. And if that machine needs to be replaced, cool. Take the volumes that you mounted, take them somewhere else, plop your thing out, do your port mapping, you're done. For simple things like this, It squished it. No, it didn't. It's right here. So it actually pulled in a CentOS image instead of one of the other ones. 
So you, yeah, you still have intermediaries that you have to take care of. Um, let's go back to this. That's really all I got officially. Um, so let's say you want to do this at scale. Let's say you're that guy who has many developers, not you, Bjorn, Phil, who has many developers that want to do cool stuff, and they want to constantly create new things and do cool stuff. Um, and they don't want to use Vagrant all the time on their workstation. They actually want an environment that they can deploy real production to or whatever it might be. They can create a Docker container. And I kind of alluded it to it being, on here, Docker's not listening on TCP. It's only listening on a, a Unix domain socket and var lib uh, run docker.sock. So it's only on the local workstation. You can have Docker listen on a TP, TCP socket. You can have it listen over SSL. You can do authentication and authorization. You can specify resources for users. You can do all kinds of those multi-tenancy kind of fun stuff. And then you could have you know, a host sitting there, you know, so, you know, 64 gigs of RAM, a bunch of SSD disk for your developers to go do stuff. They can create images locally, or they can set up the Docker environment and say, I'm going to point over there and give it a Docker file, build, shove the content over there. It actually builds the entire thing on the other side, not locally, and copies the file and everything over. And then they can Docker run, and you can give them their own network. That machine can have three, four, six IPs, whatever it is, and their network could be bound to the appropriate IP, and they could just say, Docker run the image they just uploaded and do the port mapping, and boom, there's their stuff, and they can mess with it and see what it is and say, oh, okay, everything's working. I found a bug. Okay, go back home, fix their PHP, or in your case, are they still doing PHP work? Yeah, so they can make a couple changes to their stuff, pull it from the repository, make changes, go in, iterate, iterate, iterate over and over again. They don't need a crazy beefy laptop because they're using system resources from somewhere else, and they just do this over and over and over again, all day, every day. And then when it's time for production, a couple different ways you can do this. If you want to do this the full Docker blown way, you can set up your own private Docker registry. And you can have them commit the, the things that they did to your registry. <clears throat> or have change control do, you know, if you've got somebody doing QC that's actually doing real testing, and they say, yep, that image is gold. We're going to tag it as such, put it in the full registry, and then on a production cluster, you push out that image to all of them, and then you update them one at a time, assuming you're behind a load balancer or something more interesting. That's the, what I describe is actually the simpleton's way. It's an older way of doing this. Docker has what they call swarm, which is an interesting thing. You still do the first half where you basically have a develop machine where you can have people do stuff, and you still want a registry. Docker swarm is an abstraction. To the CLI and to the command or to the user, they're still connecting to something that looks like a regular Docker server. But Swarm is actually talking to multiple hosts all over. You can register 10, 15, 10,000 different Docker hosts back to Docker Swarm. You can do full multi-tenancy. You can define a whole bunch of networks. You can do a whole bunch of stuff. And basically, when it's time for production, you can say, OK, I want to create 10 containers in this environment name them sequentially, deploy them across the entire thing, and go. But if you're really good, you use something even better. Jenkins does its QC, does its all its testing. If everything looks cool, great. Jenkins pushes that to your, pushes the image to the container. Somebody says, yep, that's good. Jenkins picks up on the version control pushes it to your swarm, it gets deployed to wherever the hell you want, and then when it's time, it updates all the containers, it actually deploys new containers, talks to your load balancer and says, change all of this from here to there. Nobody knew a damn thing. 
and you successfully, from end to end, went from writing code on a workstation to deploying it to the end. There's a whole bunch of details in there, don't get me wrong, but it's totally doable within a relatively short period of time. And I know your next question is, can I do, run this on our VMware infrastructure? And the answer is yes, it's coming. This is why. When we turn the camera off, I'll tell you about that. <laughs> oh. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. So that's the beauty of this, is that, OK, you, you're, you, you standardize on CentOS for all of those things. You see that there's a bulletin out for, God help me if Heartbleed happens again, but something along, along those lines. Cool. Ah, a yum update also updated this and that and that. What, what are the effects of having, you, you didn't fully drink the CentOS or Red Hat Kool-Aid and you're afraid that this is gonna have other side effects from doing a yum update security or any of those kind of things. Okay, Phoenix Project. All the containers, I don't care. I'm tossing them now. I'm gonna do a yum pull. I'm gonna basically re-image my, the same image that I had, give it a new tag, it'll, if it's based on CentOS, it'll automatically pull the differences in CentOS. You gotta read some you know, release files to make sure that the, the things that you want are actually in there. You can go in there and Docker exec yourself just to see, to, to verify for yourself. I have a new image. The same process that I used to get it to production, I can now do to update Heartbleed like this. Don't have to go Ansible to go all your hosts and do a yum update. You don't have to take, okay, I'm gonna have to do this. Let's do some steps. Let's go to my dev environment and check it, okay. So that's an interesting one. Um, if you're gonna use CentOS or Red Hat for your Docker hosts, yeah, you, you might have to update those guys too. The, there are alternatives to that, many of them. Um, one of the more popular ones is CoreOS. It's amazingly tiny. Uh, it does Docker, but it also does some of the other orchestration stuff like Kubernetes and Mesos, um, which I didn't really get into because I don't play with those that much. Um, but it is, they're, they're tiny, and the, the philosophy behind CoreOS is there's essentially, it boots into memory. There's nothing for you to change. The entire system is basically read-only. When you need to do an update, it takes an update, the, takes the update image, applies it to a different partition, adjusts the bootloader, and reboots into that one. So they're taking the Phoenix project type approach to a host. So it, it now you're updated, you're done. And they release updates like on a really regular, regular basis, like every six weeks, I think. I can't remember what it was. And then it, it just applies over here, reboot, go over there. Apply over here, reboot, go over there. And if you've got an orchestration framework like Swarm or Mesos or Kubernetes, it will notice that the Docker container on those went away. And since you as the user specified, I want that, I, I need 10 instances of this container everywhere, it'll say, oh, that went away, crap, okay. It'll, resp it'll spawn off new containers in, uh, on other hosts across your environment. So you might lose capacity for a second, but then you're back. If you're doing session management correctly, nobody will even notice. Beauties. Higher levels of distraction. That's what we're talking about here. I'm not gonna get into the orchestration because I really have not played with, I played with Swarm a little bit and it's very, very cool, but there are a lot of things that I don't understand. How they do image management and, you know, do you wanna get into the, all your hosts have shared disk access, either NFS or something else, and there's a bunch of different ways to skin that cat and I just really haven't played with it that much, so. Questions, concerns, comments? There's no tomatoes. If you're on OS 10, and like I'm going to use for a Mac OS if you're on OS 10, try to get into the Docker beta. It's much, much better than what they have. The right Docker now. machine? Uh, no, the Docker machine is the bad one. Yeah, that one's yeah. apparently terrible. Yeah, basically the, the previous model, because Docker only runs on Linux. They, they right now. Virtual, right now, right now. <laughs> they have a virtual box. Um, Machines, they'll spin up for you. Yep. And 
it led to a lot of problems for me and Chris like Docker. But they have since you released could. the beta now for OS 10 and it uses apparently OS 10 native virtualization instead of Linux machine. Oh. And it's much faster and all the networking stuff is not broken like it was before. Um, so if you're on OS 10, use the beta. You have to apply for an but I think that they just give them out there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. And <clears throat> by the way, Docker is coming to Windows too. I don't exactly know what that means yet, but they're they're hyping it a huge amount for a Windows Nano Server, where you can run a whole bunch of different applications basically containerized. It's going to be interesting because I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work. Since some things still require a GUI to install and whatnot, but it should be interesting. It's not. So um, the, the core OS guys, they've got something called Rocket. Um, I can't remember who else has one. Those are the two big ones that I can remember. Um, and, and they're different image formats and different ways to build stuff. But um, the core OS guys and the Docker guys actually started talking. And there's something called the OCI, the Open Container Image Format. And they're actually working on a standard for building open containers. So then if you want to run your container on Rocket, cool. You want to run it on Docker, cool. You want to run it on LXC the old way, cool, whatever. So it's, it's a, just an open platform for running images. Just like uh, VMware worked on, VMware and others worked on OVA, the open uh, virtualization format. So it's coming. And this is, I think, Docker and friends are only like three years old. This, it, that's a lot. A lot has happened in three years. And it's no longer a toy. There's a lot of large companies that are running Docker in production. I think eBay just has made a presentation on DockerCon. There's a whole bunch of other people that are big into it. It's, it's so big right now, and this, is gonna, this, this was surprising to me. The, one of the biggest um, commercial software out there is starting to go to, co to Docker. Their name is IBM. IBM distributes some chunks of their stuff now as Docker images. I was like, You're, this is a lie. You're trolling me. And I looked it up. And no, uh, Data Power, which is one of their um, API gateway type things, is actually being the newer versions are being distributed as a Docker image. Their Liberty Alliance stuff, which does a bunch of API translation and, and uh, security and authorization, they ship it. The, the selling point for that is it's a Node.js server that does some fun stuff for you, and you can actually run some other Java stuff with it too. They ship the entire thing as a Docker image. The work, the, the chunk that manages that also ships as a Docker image. I was like, whoa, we're we talking about the same IBM here? That's was really weird. Yeah. And it's so big, it even made people like VMware change their position on containers before. When they first started coming out, they're like, ah, that's a bunch of stuff. Now, actually, for I think about a year now, they actually have what they call the VMware integrated containers, where it'll use some of the fancier shared file system from VMFS to let you do, you basically can set up a Docker swarm on VMware and it will automatically create VMs appropriately and attach disks. It does volume management and all that fun stuff all underneath the covers. You would never know that it's running on VMware. It's just doing its thing. And the craziest thing that I've seen so far is the OpenStack Summit just finished like a week or two or, or two weeks ago, and I was watching some of the live videos. Um, this is crazy, but there's a thing called Docker Stack. Somebody actually took the entire oh, somebody by somebody. I think it was actually Ubuntu and some of their other and some other people. You want a small OpenStack environment to mess around with and learn how to use? Cool, we got a thing for you. They've got a set of scripts that will literally create. Uh, the equivalent Nova, um, CIDR, all of the different chunks within the OpenStack environment. They'll create containers, including 
Neutron, which is the virtual the network virtualization component, and they'll tie things back and forth between containers, even on different machines. They'll use the overlay network driver to get stuff to go back to Neutron to do things. It what when I saw that presentation, I was like, holy crap, how deep down the rabbit hole have we gone here? And because it makes it easy. It makes it easy to just deploy a thing so many times so easily. I was like, oh yeah, it makes sense. Anything else? Ellie, thanks. Yep. A lot of good information there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the uh, camera off and you can. Uh... <laughs> By the way, this camera has an interesting quirk. I don't know why somebody would want to have a mirrored image, oh, uh, but I could not figure out how to unmirror it. So if you actually want to read anything that was on his slides, you need to hold it up to the mirror. No. Don't don't watching. don't do that. I'll post on the gate log, or I'll give you the the address for the presentations. They're all public. Thanks, man. All right.